Our gospel lesson for this morning comes from Matthew's gospel, chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. Listen for God's word. A disciple is not above the teacher, Jesus said, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear for them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thine sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our passage for this morning is part of a longer passage in which, after several healings and exorcisms, Jesus sends out his 12 disciples to all the cities of Israel, giving them, quote, authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and sickness. Clearly, he's calling them to follow his example. He's sending them out to be little Christs in the world. In our passage for today, he warns them that they, if they are indeed to be like little Christs, they can expect to be treated like the Christ himself. A disciple is not above the teacher, he says, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Jesus continues by assuring the disciples of both how important each one of them is to God. Even the hairs of your head are all counted, he says. And just how seriously unpleasant this mission is going to be. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Incidentally, this is the first time that Jesus mentions the cross in the Gospel of Matthew. It's important to note that it presumes not only Jesus' end, but also that of the disciples. All roads lead to Golgotha even the ones we are on today. Now, when I was a young man, I suspect that I found a certain amount of glamour in this notion. There was something heroic about the Christian life, a certain amount of glory in taking up your own crosses and following Jesus, onward Christian soldiers and all that. This imagined glamour and glory were, of course, in direct proportion to how little I had up until that point actually carried my own cross. But then again, I've always been blessedly gifted with a remarkable lack of self-awareness. The truth of the matter is that there's nothing glamorous or heroic about this Christ care, about this cross carrying at all. It's messy and ugly. It has consequences. 
Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, Jesus says. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. There's something deeply ironic about the fact that Jesus is sending his disciples out into the world to heal and cast out demons, to preach good news to the poor and liberate the captives, and then telling them to expect that they will be met not with gratitude, but with persecution and hostility. Indeed, these good deeds, these acts of those little Christs, will make their own families turn against them and shun them. If they are all so precious in God's eyes, you are of more value than many sparrows, he says. Why is, they, why is he sending them off like sheep into the midst of many wolves, as he himself describes it? I remember a few years ago marveling at the fact that in my life, my faith had not made me happy. Indeed, my faith has always made me unhappy, mostly with myself, but certainly with the world. If we are sent out into the world like little Christs, then we begin necessarily to see the world at least a little bit through the eyes of the Christ. We see the injustice a little bit more sharply and take it just a little bit more personally. We note how far short we ourselves forever fall from the glory of God with every breath we take and how we indeed not only participate in the systemic oppression of the vulnerable in this world, but benefit from it ourselves. And just like the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, there is nowhere we can go to escape this awareness. If I ascend to heaven, you are there, the psalmist says. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Indeed, our culpability and the sheer amount of suffering in this world becomes not only apparent, but impossible to ignore. As if the whole of the sorrow of the cosmos were contained in a baby's heart piercing cry of distress that just won't ever stop. And yet, paradoxically, I find my life suffused with, if not happiness, than joy. It's taken me a very long time to know the difference. Just as it has taken me a very long time to understand that Christian love is not the same thing as being nice to everyone, or polite for that matter. God save us from nice Christians. What manner of cowardice and hypocrisy have been masked in Christian niceness? Those who find their life will lose it, Jesus says, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. What we lose when Jesus sends us out into the world like little Christs is the license to hide our heads in the sand. We lose our license to be neutral or naive. No longer are we allowed to lie with, to ourselves with impunity or hide behind our pride. No longer are we free to puff up our chests and shout to the world, spewing spit from our lips, that we don't have a racist bone in our bodies. We relinquish our masks of avoidance and our right to leave the ideology of white supremacy lurking in our hearts, undiscovered and unhealed. We are no longer free to pretend that this privilege doesn't exist just because we happen to have worked hard in our lives for everything we've gotten, as if we were the only ones. No more nonsense. No more spiritual immaturity. No more wasting of precious time. We lose so much when Jesus sends us out to be little Christs. Oh, but what we find, the breathtaking depth of love and its consequences, the great mystery of grace and how it truly changes all equations, 
the miracle of a meaningful life, a purposeful life and community and fellowship and how that foundation can make all the difference during a dark night of a soul. The promise and actuality of liberation, of deliverance, of justice, of freedom, forgiveness, resurrection. What a small, small price to pay for joy. Amen.